1. I was scheduled on the first super nice day of the year for an all-day patio shift. I was having some problems. My card wasn't working on the patio point of sale, but it worked inside at a different machine. Okay. It took about three hours on the phone to get IT to get it to work. So after I get the patio open, I start to get a pretty steady amount of tables. About four or five at a time of differing needs. Some at all drinks, some want the whole kit and caboodle. It's the beginning of a long day. An actually fabulous turn of events. I could use the money. I set myself up for success with plenty of app plates, silverware and bus tubs. I'm ready to rock it out, aside from the aforementioned IT issue. Well, 4 to 5 turns into about 7, which would usually be completely fine, but I'm having to save a lot of steps to make sure I'm ringing stuff in, and running beverages at the same time. It's a balancing act that I'm honestly just barely pulling off. Some smart lady made sure my station accommodated as many foreseeable issues as possible, right? I had dropped bar drinks at table 202 and had soft drinks for two other tables on my same tray. I tell 202 that I'll be right back to grab their order after I drop the rest of the tray. Well, y'all can tell what I want to do. Have 202 place their food order and tap the next two tables for their food while crossing my fingers that nobody takes too long. I drop drinks at the remaining tables. With one saying they're ready to order as my hands were still full. Okay, great, give me a second and I'll be right with you. I head to 202 and grab a mildly complicated but still very normal food order for five people. They still kept me at the table about one minute more than I felt comfortable leaving ready to order folks waiting. After I collect menus and let them know that it's going to take a few moments longer than usual, as I always do when I'm juggling like this, I turn my back and hear an, Excuse me? Yes, ma'am. She's holding her phone at me. Could you take our picture? 25 seconds of calculation. They're dressed in nicer clothes. It's a table of all women. They're already fiddling with their straws and garnishes. This will not be a quick snapshot. I'm so sorry, but I'm very busy right now and I'm unable to do that. What? What about your tip? Don't you care about service? At this point, another table adjacent to them flagged me down for the Wi-Fi password before L202 could even finish her sentence. I write it down on a BevNap, since they weren't native English speakers, and turn to attempt to calm L202 down. I can have another... I can't believe this, girl. Doesn't want to help us! At that point, I knew it was a lost cause, grabbed my remaining food orders and make the trek to the far-off point of sale. I immediately send a co-worker to take their picture as I'm heading to plug the orders in. Afterwards, I find a manager to warn them about these women at 202. I wanted a leg up on the eventual complaint. I don't think I've ever been so mad at a table. And I once had someone wolf whistle at me for attention. They literally attempted to laud my tip over my head, as if that's supposed to make me snap to their oh-so-special attention. Like, this is a two-way street. Neither of us is supposed to mention the tip during our interaction, and you leave whatever you feel like without a production of it. Spoiler alert, they declined the picture offer from the other server. Service lightens up after the foods were in, and I killed everyone. With kindness. 202 and every other table. No one waited for anything. I was check ready for every round. I wasn't going to let these women say that I provided bad service to the surrounding tables and to them too. Now nah, fuck that. I got a message on every CC slip during that hour. Most of them raved about the service. L202 never looked me in the eye again. But from 202, I got three slips back. One that contained the diatribes of a mad person about how this was their first time here and they'll never be back and how I'm a terrible server, written in the most aggressive and large handwriting I've ever seen on a CC message. Maybe they hated my thank you message? I'll never know. One of their CC slips came back with a nice pic and zero tip written on it. I could honestly respect that one. My GM told me after hearing the situation that I should have said, I'm a terrible picture taker, let me grab a better photographer. Pro-level shit. Next time I know exactly what to say. So there you go. The angriest I've ever been at a table, 
and I still served them to the literal extent of my abilities in that moment. Afterwards, my point of sale did get fixed, and I had a great shift even after they stiffed me on $80. I don't know. Read the room, ladies. Two. Holy moly, y'all, we made it through yesterday, and what a doozy it was. Now, our place is very popular, and well known in the states that we have restaurants in. Pictures from our place have made the front page of Reddit several times. Mother's Day is also our busiest day of the year. Each year there is a contest of all the local spots to see who made the most business, set the most guests, and the location I work at won the contest for the second year in a row. I started my Mother's Day at 6am to help open the restaurant. By 9am we were on a wait, and stayed on a wait until 2.30 when we closed. I really started feeling tired from the day around 12.30 to 1pm, so by the time I got this table to 20 to 2.30ish, I was just ready to get them their food and GTFO. After I get them their drinks and start to take their order, the mom at the table begins to ask me questions about various dishes she claims are on our menu. Now I've been working at this place for about two months at this point, but have never seen anything like what she is describing to me. The family even requested I go talk to the kitchen to make sure I knew what I was talking about. Slightly annoying, as I know we don't have these things, but they won't drop it until they have the proof. Because I let them in on the secret that I had started working there about two months ago, apparently. The mom will be CM for Clueless Mom, the dad will just be D. I return to the table and apologize, saying no, we don't have those things. Or the ingredients to even attempt to prepare what they are requesting. The mom straight up pulls out her phone and shows me what she's talking about, because they are convinced. Look right here! This is from your Yelp page. You guys were serving this just a month ago. So you must know about it. As soon as I see the picture of the food, it hits me. This is not our restaurant. Ma'am, that is not our food. Our plates are very distinct. And that food is on something completely different. But we were here! She shows me her phone again to prove to me that she knows where she is, as the map has the distinct blue dot showing their location. Yes, our restaurant is located in that area, but you are looking at a different restaurant on Yelp. CM backs the phone up and shows it to me again. Y'all, she was looking at a completely different restaurant's Yelp. CM insists they are in the right place. D was catching on quickly, pulled up my restaurant's Yelp, after turning over his menu to check the name of where they were. Oh, you're looking for Mr. Pippengrown's restaurant. Yes, they are very close by. In the same shopping center, in fact, just a little ways up. And I do know they have the pork belly and soft pretzels you were showing me. D finally has my restaurant's Yelp up and shows it to me. Yes, that's us. See the plates? That's what we serve our food on. Wait, what? What is the name of this place? My mind blew right there. We have been on a wait since 9am, so you didn't just walk in. Plus, you had to walk in a building with our name on it. You were sat with menus with our name on it. You already told me what you want to eat, and you still don't know where you are. I could barely handle it with this table. I'm sorry, we're going to need a few more minutes to decide. I'm all smiles. Of course, I totally understand. I'll check back with you in just a few. When I checked back in, they told me to go ahead and put the order in. So they ended up staying and in the end left me four dollars. Wish they would have just left. 3. This was St. Patrick's Day last year. We were a four-floor pub, and very much a haven for travelers and immigrants in our city. This particular St. Pat's was the perfect storm. Beautiful day. Saturday, and an England vs. Ireland rugby game at 8am. Typically, we don't open till 11, because that's when we can start serving booze in my area. But we opened early that day to accommodate the foreigners in our city who wanted to catch some rugby action. I had a lovely 8am start time, which might not be that bad normally, but I closed the night before. That's right. Due to a scheduling error, I finished my Friday night shift at 3am, and was back at work at 7.30 a.m., groggy and sleep-deprived, ready to tackle what could be the worst day in my career. Up I go to the rooftop patio, 
sun shining brightly, and a lovely spring chill in the air. What do I find? I have two sections today. Two. I guess we were understaffed, and I was one of the few servers they trusted to handle two sections at once on St. Patrick's Day. As people start filtering in for the rugby game, I busy myself making coffee, trying to stock up for a wild morning. It's $5 breakfast during rugby games. And since people can't order booze, there's gonna be a lot of coffee going out. We have four to five pots ready, but by 8.30 the restaurant is full and we've run out of coffee completely. It took half an hour for our 250 capacity patio to fill entirely. I'm running around like a madman, taking breakfast orders which, as many servers know, is the hardest meal to take orders for. Eggs, bread, protein, and any mods that come with it, in addition to setting up which requires ketchup, steak, sauce, jam, peanut butter, and hot sauce. By 9am, we're so behind on coffee that guests are waiting 45 minutes for refills. We've got coffee machines on two other floors trying to make coffee for the patio. And one manager is sitting by the coffee machine and not moving, just making a pot, handing it to a server, and making another. We've also run out of hot water in the restaurant. Our coffee machines only heat so much water at a time. So guests who don't want to wait for coffee are ordering tea instead. But the tea is lukewarm, and nobody likes lukewarm tea. I'm promising guests left, right, and center that I'm doing my best in trying to get them coffee and tea ASAP. But at this point, both of my sections are full. I counted after my shift. But I had 106 guests at this point, entirely to myself. A host of 10 to 12 tops, lots of 8s, a few 2s and 4s and a section along the bar of people just standing and mingling. Thank the heavens for the rugby game, because even though it brought in this madness, it's at least distracting people and keeping them occupied, while I literally sprint from table to table. Things have calmed down around 10.30. Everyone's eaten, and we finally caught up on coffee. But guess what's around the corner? 11 a.m when we're legally allowed to start serving booze on St. Patrick's Day in a bar full of Irish and English people at capacity. Guests are now starting to ask if they can place their orders early so that they can get their drinks as soon as possible. But I'm too busy. I tell them it's too early and that they'll have to wait until closer to 11. However, a pair of lovely Irish gentlemen call me over and offer to take good care of me if I make sure their drinks come first and keep a close eye on them throughout the day. A man of principles, I obviously accept, and take their drink order. Guests nearby see me doing so, and I can't avoid it any longer. So I spend the next little while grabbing drink orders for everyone in my sections. Lots of people are ordering drinks two at a time, as they can see how busy I am and obviously have noticed that service is a little slow today. 11am hits, servers start punching drinks around 10.30, and by the time we start pouring, the entire bar is covered in chits. Not one single inch of countertop is visible. And that's only about half the chits. The rest still spilling forth from the chit machine. As it's St. Patrick's Day, obviously we're selling a lot of Guinness. But I can't stress how much. The bartender literally can't pour fast enough to keep up. Gone are the traditions in pouring a Guinness. No half pours are waiting. Just top up the glass and on to the next. A young Irish guy himself, he looked at me at one point and said, If me da saw me now, he disowned me. The bartender is falling behind, so two managers each go to a different floor, one even opening up a bar that was typically closed during the day, and start pouring Guinness themselves. They were bringing them upstairs on trays twenty at a time, before sprinting back down to keep pouring. Once the initial rush had passed, the rest of the day ran pretty smoothly. People stuck to ordering two drinks at a time, which really saved my butt, knowing I could drop the drinks off and not have to worry about that guest for a while. We had another rugby game at noon, and another at 2pm, so my section stayed full literally until the end of my shift. Most of my guests cleared out after the last rugby game, conveniently ending alongside my shift. No one got too drunk, which was really surprising. I did have to cut off a table who'd had 12 ounces of vodka each throughout the day, but they seemed fine. It was just a numbers game at that point. I end up sending them down the block to another pub, and they seemed happy enough. 
The only issue I had that day was a young guy who had several pints, a bottle of white wine, and a bottle of Prosecco to himself. I cut him off when he started to slur, and explained why, letting him know we wouldn't be serving him any more alcohol that day. He got his friends to go to the bar and keep ordering him drinks, so we kicked him out. Sweet justice. All in all, we went through ten, ten kegs of Guinness during the day shift alone. I sold around $3,500 Canadian, and this includes the aforementioned $5 breakfasts, 106 guests, 4 hours of sleep, and a wild 9-hour shift. Stuck around for a half pint of Guinness myself after that shift, but that's all the celebrating I did that day. Went home immediately after, and passed out till about midnight. At the end of the day, the two Irish guys who promised to take care of me admitted they didn't know what a good tip was and let me enter it myself. I threw a clean 30% on the bill, explained how tip percentages worked, and thanked them sincerely. 4. We had a dedicated 10-person team, but John and I were really the only ones who cooked. Eventually I became the manager, although I was still the only other person who knew how to run the kitchen aside from John, which means a lot of responsibility fell on me. At the time, I was really new to the position and not yet jaded by what happens to people in the industry. My mission was to become the best, highest earning restaurant in our district, which meant getting rid of John and replacing him with someone not disgusting. This was not going to occur. What follows is a list of things I witnessed over the years from John while doing all I could to legally get rid of him. He was a smoking fiend. He would leave the kitchen every half hour or so to smoke, but he was also poor, by choice, so he would only smoke half a cigarette. He'd keep the halves in his pack, and always reeked of burnt cigarettes on top of smelling like a chain smoker. He would constantly stick random extra food that he was cooking into his mouth. If something landed on his hand, he'd lick it off. I don't know how customers did not notice this as we had an opening that allowed for view into the kitchen from the dining area. He would regularly steal stacks of our napkins on his way out the door. I can only assume they were used as toilet paper, as he was poor, by choice. We had a single-use bathroom in the back for staff. If he had just finished using it, and just to change, like not even for bathroom use, I would not be able to go in due to the smell. Sometimes I needed to change for my shift, and I would literally hold my breath while I changed as fast as I could, so that I did not have to breathe in whatever nasty residual smell was left over from his presence. One of our specialities was an affordable, simple breakfast in the morning hours. He could never cut the toast from corner to corner. It's a fucking piece of square toast. How hard is it to line up the knife at the corners and make a cut? Cut the toast right. Fuck. If I went out of my way and decided to do some deep cleaning in the kitchen, the next day, he would make an even bigger mess than usual. It would be like he forgot how to stir properly and suddenly there were soup splatters up the wall. He would never clean up after himself. Speaking of cleaning, we had a mysterious blob of mashed potatoes on our kitchen ceiling. I asked if he could clean it several times. He didn't, and eventually I got a ladder to get up there and clean it. He watched me do it while telling me how nice my ass jiggled. His pinky fingernail on both hands was longer than all other nails. He was too poor, by choice, for coke, so it was probably used to dig into his nose for green treasures. All his food came out greasy. He constantly sprayed the flat top with oil. It was a sea of oil. Once he put his plate up, I was surprised the food didn't just fly off and land on the floor. He didn't own a cell phone. If he wanted to call in sick, it would be from a payphone next to his local bar. If I wanted to get in touch with him, well, fuck me. That's what I mean when I say he was poor by choice. I'm not being snooty. He was poor through bad habits. I mentioned he smoked like a fiend. He also drank quite a bit. So a large portion of his paycheck went to that. He ate most of his meals at the restaurant for free despite rules against that. For fun, I once calculated how much he was costing the place with all the free food he ate. It ended up being 20000 annually. He did not care to better his life. I also mentioned I became a manager. He could have as well and gotten a pay bump. 
he chose not to do this. Just kept coasting. I really could go on, but how much more can you stand to hear? Please tell me that you know a John at your job. I don't want to be alone. 5. So a few years ago, I worked at a fast food restaurant. Because we were a civilized business, we did not allow smoking indoors, much like every other fast food restaurant in the country. I'm standing at the counter, and this old guy walks in the door with a lit cigarette. I can smell it all the way across the restaurant. Smoke is billowing in front of him and into the faces of other guests. I yell out, Sir, you can't have that in here. Please go outside if you want to smoke. He looks at me like I told him Obama got a third term. Fine, I'll put it out. And he throws the lit cig in the trash can next to the door. Side note, the trash receptacles we used were metal, but inside was a plastic can. Standard affair for a restaurant. So Archie Bunker is walking towards me at the counter when I see smoke coming out of the trash can. A lady bellows out and I quote, Oh hell, that shit is burning. The old guy is about to reach the counter when I run around the side and into the lobby. Hey, can I order first? He says, completely indifferent to the situation which was currently unfolding. Ignoring him, I kicked the door open and rolled the trash can outside into the thankfully empty parking lot. My manager followed behind with a fire extinguisher, which he used to put out the ongoing dumpster fire. I opened up the little door on the receptacle to discover that part of the plastic can had melted due to the flame, and it was ruined. I re-entered the restaurant, and unfortunately, it stunk like hell. And the geriatric fireball was still standing at the counter. Can I order now? He said. Fucking stinks like shit in here. My manager says to him in the calmest way possible, Sir, you could have burned this restaurant down. There are clear signs on each of the doors that say no smoking. There is an ashtray block outside that you are meant to put your butts out on before you enter my restaurant. I don't think I've been in a bar that allows smoking indoors since 1980. I'm going to have to ask you to leave. The old man, who I had never seen before that day, gets all huffy and puffy and says, I've been coming here for 15 years. Never mind the fact that we had only been open for a year and a half at that point. And no one has ever said anything to me about that. You've lost a lifelong customer today. I hope you're happy. My manager says, Better that I lost a fire hazard. And the old man storms out, lighting up another cigarette outside the building. Like clockwork. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Spinning Plates number 45. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Be almost a year we've been doing these soon. Time flies. Well, if all goes well, by the time you guys hear this, I should be building uh, my new PC. Uh, all the parts should have arrived by on Friday. Everything kept getting sent earlier than it was scheduled, so I don't know what that was about. It's all scheduled to arrive together on Friday, but they've arrived sporadically over a few days, but... Uh, almost everything's here, just waiting on the case and the thermal compound. Gotta have that. Would be unfortunate to put it on without it. Uh, but, um, yeah, so if that goes well, I may be testing it out later, if it goes well. And then tomorrow, uh, if the weather's good, I'll be a little trip to buy some fishies for my fish tank. Uh, fish tank's all put together now. I put pictures up on Instagram for those who want to see it. Uh, a few little tweaks still to make, but yeah, it's almost good to go. I'll have to test out the uh, the pump and everything, but you know, we're just about ready. Okay, and with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.